Welcome to River City Church Online. Thank you for joining us today. It's our prayer that you're blessed by what you hear today. So let's go and join our pastor for this week's message. Today we have another special treat that we are going to be having a guest speaker today. And today it's Juliet Hurst, who is our uh, Director of Spiritual Growth here at River City Church. The title of the sermon is, What Can We Do When God Feels Far Away? And when Juliet told me that, she said, emphasis on feels, because I think we're going to be learning about how, um, how to un interpret that and to uh, change how we're feeling about things. So looking forward to that today. Well, hello, everybody. Hello. Today, we are going to talk about why God feels sometimes so far away. Why does this happen? Does this happen to everybody? Is this normal? And what might God want to teach us or reveal to us during this? So these are some really big questions. So how about we take a little moment in prayer before we jump in? Father, I just give this message to you. You know what each person is walking in here with. You know what we're carrying. You know what our relationship with you is like, whether we're all good, whether we're struggling, whether you're far away, Father, or whether you feel that way. And I just pray that you can just take my words and transform them into something that glorifies you and that ministers to us today. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So our lives are full of challenges. That is true for all of us. But when we experience these challenging seasons in life, do you ever feel like God feels far away? That he maybe feels distant? Maybe missing in action? Well, I remember having one of these experiences myself. You know, life was going great. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I lost a really close friend. One of my child, our children decided that following Jesus just really wasn't for them anymore. And members of our extended family just stopped talking to one another. And this, of course, all happened in the height of COVID-19. And I was wondering, God, where are you? Do you see this? Do you see me? Do you care? I'm the kind of person that doesn't like being blindsided at all, let alone experiencing a series of blindsides. So what did I do? Well, I did what any logical person would do. I cried out to God, and I mean this literally. I woke up, I went for a walk, and I sobbed daily, day after day. Now, fortunately, there was um, nobody that I ran into during my walking and talking to God in crying sessions, but I kind of wonder if there were some people that were maybe sipping their morning coffee, looking out the window, saying, there she goes again. Now, this isn't a new thing. Many people in the Bible have experienced this, including King David. While David was chosen by God to be the king of Israel, he sure didn't have it easy. During his reign from 1010 to 970 BC, he faced a series of intense trials. And one of the ways that he dealt with this was by talking with God. And we can read about this in a book of the Bible called the Psalms. Many of the Psalms are read as desperate prayers to God in a time of trouble. The Psalms capture the pain and the agony of extreme suffering, but also highlighting God's glory and grace. Today we're going to be walking through Psalm 22 together. So if you open your Bibles, the book of Psalms is found right in the middle. It's right after Job and right before Proverbs. Psalm 22 is a cry of someone who knows pain and suffering and isn't afraid to talk about it. One of the important things to notice in this psalm is that David alternates between looking up to God and directing his statements towards him and then looking around and inwards to his circumstances and his feelings. So let's get started. David says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the cries of my anguish? My God, I cry out to you by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. So David comes out of the gate with complete honesty and extreme vulnerability. 
In this passage, he says, I feel forsaken by you, Lord. And to be forsaken is defined as to turn away from, to be deserted by, to be rejected by, or to be abandoned. So these are strong emotions. And David's sufferings, he directs them to God in a prayer called lament. And lament is where you put your raw, unprocessed feelings before God in prayer. So one of the things I'd like to, you to notice right off the bat is that David, what he's freaking out is addressing God as my God. Even though he is struggling, although he is feeling like God has maybe abandoned him, his relationship with God remains intimate and personal. God isn't just some distant entity in the universe, but is something, someone that David knows well and that knows him. It is evident that he trusts God, despite his feelings of abandonment and despair, because he boldly calls God his God. There are times in our lives where we get into such dire circumstances that we are beyond human help. When we encounter these difficult emotions, such as grief or frustration, bitterness, despair, anxiety, etc., the best thing we can do is talk to God about it. But the hardest part is that God doesn't always answer us. These desperate prayers that we pray the way we expect him to or in our timeline. When this happens, we can jump to the conclusion that we're abandoned by God or that he doesn't care or that he's just too busy. We feel all alone in our suffering and boy, that can be a scary place to be. While our feelings are telling us this might be true, the f these aren't the same as facts. Feelings are an emotional state or reaction to something. You know, feelings come and go, they change a lot. While facts are something that are known to be true and have evidence or proof, facts don't change unless new information is introduced. When we feel abandoned by God, it feels real, but this isn't true because God doesn't disappear on us. He's not potpourri. Remember that green spotted kangaroo type animal that showed up on the polka dot door as kids? Well, maybe I'm, I'm dating myself. You know, pokeroo was there, and then pokeroo was gone, and then pokeroo was back again. But you know what? God isn't like that because God is omnipresent, which means he is everywhere all at the same time. So disappearing isn't in his nature. So back to our passage. Yet you were enthroned as the Holy One. You are one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. So there's a saying that goes, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And God is consistent. He doesn't change. And in these verses, David briefly gives his attention towards God and remembers these things. Because, you know, God is like an anchor to us in times of trouble. And an anchor helps ships from just floating away into the ocean. It, it, it keeps them from just from moving. And likewise, God can help us from being swept away by our feelings, our thoughts, and our false impressions and interpretations of reality. In his anguish, David remembers God's past faithfulness in Israel's history. They put their trust in God, and he delivered them from adversity. This helped David remember the truth about God, not just a distorted truth based on his feelings and emotions. David reminded himself who God truly is, a God who can be trusted, a God that delivers and saves us, and a God who does not put us to shame. When life throws us in difficult circumstances, we generally react emotionally, and our emotions can go crazy. We start filling in the blanks with, why did this happen? Or um, kind of making up our own dialogue. And while this is perfectly normal, it can lead us to a downward spiral, which can result in something called an amygdala hijack. 
The amygdala is at the emotional center of our brain, which is responsible for our fight, flight, and freeze responses. Now, this is all well and good, but the problem happens when our amygdala takes over the thinking center of our brain called the cortex. When this happens, our decisions are based on emotions, which are often impulsive and irrational. For example, speaking from our passage, if I'm feeling forsaken by God, I could panic and start freaking out and thinking, you know what, God has deserted me and he is not coming back. I must have done something to cause him to stop loving me. And now I have to come up with something or someone that will just replace God in my life. A better way to deal with this is to name my, my emotion and to remember a concrete fact about God through scripture. So if I'm feeling forsaken by God, what does the Bible say about this? In Deuteronomy 31, 8, it says, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Now, I don't know about you, but just reading these words helps my anxiety and blood pressure start to de-escalate. And this will interrupt this amygdala hijack. It'll calm us down. It'll return us to more, a more rational state. However, for David, this did not last for very long. So back to our scripture, he says, but I am a worm, not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusted the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. So David is looking back to his circumstances, but this time his abandonment shifts from God to the people of Israel. He's despised and rejected. We don't really know why, but it might be because his faith does not match his circumstances. They're basically saying, if God's real and on your side, then why isn't he rescuing you? This is honestly kicking someone while they're down. And it wouldn't be surprising if David just threw in the towel right here and now. But it is times like this when the rubber meets the road and where we need to decide whether we're going to give up or whether we're going to trust God no matter what. In my opinion, this is also when our faith can speak the loudest to our non-believing friends. This is because we're believing something to be true without external evidence, which is what faith is. So continuing with our passage, David says, yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust you. Even at my mother's breast, from birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. So David's eyes look back up to the Lord, but he's not just speaking about God being faithful in Israel's history. He's now talking about God being faithful to him specifically, even from birth or before birth. God sees everything. He never sleeps and he loves us more than we can possibly imagine. God is good. He is faithful all the time. And while we can only see what is right in front of us, God can see the big picture of our lives. So I remember a long time ago, Mike and I went through this really devastating pregnancy loss. And at that time, we were saying, God, where are you? What is happening here? And somebody said something to me that I found actually quite helpful. They said, Juliet, right now, if you look out of your window, all you see is the road right in front of you. That is your view. But if you went and like went up somewhere high, like looked out of the window of the CN Tower, you would have a more broad and complete view. God sees everything and the big picture of our lives and knows how the light and the dark things can be woven together to create something beautiful, something that glorifies him, and something that will show his love to others. Now, while this didn't magically take away our pain and our loss, it did help us gain a different perspective. It helped us continue to trust God, and it helped us not to lose hope. 
Now, continuing with our passage, David says, Do not be far away from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan, which are a place associated with strength, wealth, and plenty, encircle me. Roaring lions that tear my soul apart. I poured out like water, and my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up with a pot shirt, which is like a broken clay jar. And my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and feet. My bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. Now, it is easy to see David's hopelessness and desperation in his words. There are strong images of suffering and death. The threat to him is imminent. A company of evildoers surrounds him like bulls ready to charge and lions ready to devour. Often, when we're in the middle of something tough in our lives, it seems like it will last forever. Sometimes it even appears like we're a magnet for bad things happening in our lives. It's so easy for our eyes to turn away from God and onto our problems. Or we may just be in a place of fear where we're just wondering with anticipation when the next bad thing is going to happen. But then he says... But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of lions. Save me from the horns of wild oxen. Just when we thought David had completely given up, once again, he remembers the truth about God, that God is David's only hope. The power of dogs found in this passage refers to David's adversaries. In ancient times, dogs were seen as lowly pack scavengers, which prey on those who are most vulnerable. So for 20 verses, David voices his agonizing pain, his loneliness, his feelings of feeling abandoned by the Lord. And when we come to the end of ourselves, when we've tried all of our tried and true methods of solving our problems, dealing with our or the things that are, that are coming at us, we finally return God to his rightful place as the Lord of our lives. God isn't a God who abandons us, but as one who walks alongside of us and who leads us out the other side. He doesn't leave us in our sufferings alone. And this was true for David, and this is true for us as well. So let's, hear, let's see how things end up. I will declare your name to my people. In your assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him, revere him. All you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to the cry of his help. For, for, from you comes the, the theme of my praise in this great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. For the poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. And you and your hearts will live forever. All the ends of the earth will surrender and remember to turn to the Lord. And the families of the nations will bow before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship and all that go down in the dust will kneel before him, those who, not, to those who cannot keep their selves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will, they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Boy, oh boy, have things switched around. In these final 10 verses, the mood drastically shifts. We're Agonizing prayer is replaced by enthusiastic praise. What's up with that? This psalm also shifts from David's personal confession to one of public declaration. It seems that the threat has abruptly gone. The enemies who now who encircled David once have been replaced by a worshiping community. The world that once seemed like a place of danger has now become a place of joy and blessings. 
not just for David, but for the wider community as well. God heard David's cry, his desperate plea for help. God turned his face towards him, and he answered him. You guys, it is important to realize that God's silence does not mean that he's absent. When we're wounded and hurting, God is always near. Psalm 34, 18 tells us that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. This is a reminder that God always gets the last word and the hard stuff that we face in life will not last forever. This also points us to Jesus. Robert Godfrey said, this psalm is not only the experience of every believer, but it is also the very remarkable prophecy of the suffering of Jesus. Prophecy is a way that God communicates to his people and tells them the things to come. It is almost impossible to read this psalm without recalling Jesus' suffering on the cross. While Jesus was hanging on the cross, he, he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was not using words that were unique to him, but he was quoting Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 was also foreshadowing what was to come for Jesus. Jesus' garments were taken and divided. Jesus was rejected by people and nailed to a cross. And Jesus endured taunts and ridicule. And at that time, it just seemed like God was silent. Jesus, who was truly innocent, brought David's struggles to fullness by defeating sin and death for all that chose to believe in him as the Lord and Savior of their lives. So feeling forsaken by God is not a rare experience for believers. Ignatius of Loyola was a really strong and influential voice in the area of spiritual growth. And through his reading and studying and experiences, he came up with two direct movements that, um, that were um, moving us towards God, which are called desolation and consolation. So desolation means to be alone and forsaken, kind of like David experienced in Psalm 22 and Jesus' experience on the cross. Someone experiencing desolation cannot have a strong sense of God's presence. They might feel like they have a difficulty or a hard time praying. They might have a loss of faith and hope, and they feel like this will go on forever. Consolation, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. They have an increased faith, hope, and love. God seems near. And this doesn't just mean their lives are absent of problems. Rather, we can have peace in the difficult and unresolved problems of our lives. So let's get practical for a minute. What do we do when God feels far away? Number one, take some time to identify your feelings. Like I know many of us would rather bury our feelings, especially those difficult ones, but at the end of the day, these are gonna hurt us. David didn't hold his feelings back from God and we shouldn't either. When we do, it can catch up with us, maybe in the form of an amygdala hijack which often leads to impulsive emotional reactions. So I've provided you with a feelings chart. Sometimes it's just really hard to identify how we truly feel. You might think that we feel a little of this and a little of that, and it's just hard to really pick a name for it. But once we can name our feelings, they start to lose their grip on us. They just don't seem as big. The second part is pray. And this is talking to God, and listening to what he has to say to you back. Just a spoiler alert, God knows everything you're thinking and feeling. He is not going to be shook. He is not going to be offended. God loves us and wants, us to, wants him to meet us exactly where we are. So three, look at the facts. Remember what God has done in your past. And this is a great time to start looking up things in scripture. When we're feeling this way, it's a prime time for the enemy to fill our minds with, with things about like how worthless we are, how hopeless our situation is, or maybe how permanent things will be, and they'll never change. And when we press into scripture, it just really changes things. And how do we do this? Well, pick your feeling, grab your phone, and put in Bible verses. 
you will get a whole list of verses that come up and you can pick one or two that, that really ministry to you or speak to you. And it would be a really I good idea to put these verses maybe somewhere where you regularly will see them. So you're reminded of God's truth. The fourth thing is to check your perspective. Remember, nothing in this life is permanent, even though it may feel like it is. Revelations 21.4 tells us a day when God will wipe away the tears from our eyes. There will be no more death, no, neither sorrow nor crying, neither will there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And this is something all followers of Jesus can look forward to. The last thing is don't go through it alone. Find a few friends that you can trust and that will walk with you, encourage you, pray with you, and help you carry this burden. God never intended for us to go through life on our own. So Psalms teaches us not to ignore the pain in our lives, but also don't let it define us and consume us either. It reminds us that even when God is silent, that it doesn't mean he has left us. So you may be wondering how my story ended. So as I was continuing on my walking, talking with God and crying sessions, one day I said to God, God, I really need to see you and, and feel you tangibly in my life because from my perspective, it doesn't really seem like you're very on top of things. Shortly after I prayed this simple little prayer, I came across this beautiful garden. It was like something from another world. The colors were vibrant, the flowers were so different, but they complemented one another. It actually took my breath away. Later that day, I went with Mike for a walk because I wanted to show him this and maybe take a few pictures. I couldn't find this garden anywhere. We walked up and down the street and finally I recognized the house that was in front of but this garden wasn't spectacular at all. It was ordinary, it was a little chaotic even. And I don't know, you guys, maybe the sun was shining at a particular angle that day, or maybe I was just clean losing my mind. Or maybe, just maybe, God just wanted me to, me to feel him, to see him, to know that he was there with me and to possibly give me a little glimpse of something from his perspective. You decide. Thanks for checking us out today. We hope that you will join us here on YouTube or in person next week to continue our study of God's Word. If you have questions about your faith, please go to our website, rivercitychurch.org, and click on the Contact Us tab. We would love to hear from you and learn how we can serve you better. We exist in this community because of generous support from donors like you. If you would like to support this ministry because you were blessed by what you heard today, please go to our website, rivercitychurch.org, and click on the Giving tab. There'll be all kinds of options there for you where you can give to support our ministry in Cambridge, Ontario. Have a great week. I hope that God surprises you with his love today and every day. Thanks for watching.